Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Zinat Iqbal from Department of Pharmaceutics, Faculty of Pharmacy, Jamia Hamdard. Today we are going to talk on the module Parental Control Drug Delivery Systems, Implantable and Depos. This falls under the paper NDTS 1. My dear students, we have identified the learning objectives of this modules as follows. We will be talking and introducing you to the various implantable devices. We will then move on to understanding the ideal properties of an implantable drug delivery system. As a pharmaceutical scientist, we would try to appreciate the advantages and disadvantages of the system. We will then spend enough time to understand the developments in these systems which primarily focus on the in-situ depot systems and its various types and the in-situ forming implants. Then we will also go into little details of what are the various types of in-situ forming implants and then finally move to summary and conclusions. As we just probably are well aware, that the parental drug delivery systems and that too when it is required for control delivery has got a variety of options. One of the commonest and one of the most uh, sophisticated system is referred to as the implantable system. They were well uh, introduced by Lafarge in the year 1861. So the concept is very, very old one. Lafarge introduced solid implants containing implantable steroid hormones for long-term delivery. The implantable systems are usually, or what usually, are usually placed under the skin and designed to release the drug into the bloodstream at a constant rate without repeating of the insertion of the needles. So the idea is that once the system is implanted under the skin, you will be absolutely not again and again submitted for the insertion of the needles. Implantable delivery system is categorically defined as a sterile drug delivery device or system for subcutaneous implantation having the ability to deliver the drugs at a controlled rate over an extended period of time. My dear students, let us try to sum up the various ideal properties of an implantable drug delivery system. The foremost is it's being biocompatible, it is easy to sterilize, it is environmentally stable, the drug is released to be at the controlled rate, it improves the patient compliance by reducing the frequency of the drug administration over the entire period of treatment, the manufacturing process is easy and relatively inexpensive, it has a good mechanical strength and it is free from surgical procedures. My dear students, before we get into the details of the implantable drug delivery system, their designing or the various types which are there available, let us try to appreciate the various advantages which these systems present. The first advantage which comes to our mind is that they are supposedly highly patient compliant. The patient compliance is increased because once implanted, there would not be any requirement for frequent dosing. So there would be, it would allow a reduction or complete elimination of frequent drug delivery. It will also add on to the improved drug delivery. Using an implantable drug delivery system, the drug is delivered locally or systemically and it will have minimal interference from the biological or the metabolical barriers. This can be simply understood that by simply uh, compa comparing it with an oral delivery. When we are consuming something orally, which is supposedly the most convenient route, the drug device or the drug system undergoes the uh, sort of a journey, which probably uh, there's a lot of hurdles which are there because of the sheer presence of the various biological and the metabolical barriers. It has to enter, then it has to go to 
uh, going for disintegration, then finally dissolution, absorption, and finally most of the time submits itself to the first hepatic metabolism. Lot of losses as it is it is traveling through the body uh, body as such. So this probably leads to reduction. Uh, sometimes it re results in a lot of side effects and so many other problems can be there. So we can conclude that when we talk of the implantable drug delivery system, it will definitely end up having an improved drug delivery. The third important advantage which comes to our mind is the convenience. The implantation therapy permits patients to receive medication outside the hospital with medical, which is with minimal medical surveillance. So once the implant is being put inside subcutaneously, the patient need not have to stay in the hospital. He or she can move out and probably he, a doctor is not continuously required to keep a surveillance on this on the on the drug delivery device. So I would say that this becomes a very very major advantage of the implantable drug delivery system. Then one of pharmaceutical advantages or related to its uh, uh, behavior pharmaceutically mm -hmm. is its high suitability or potential for controlled release of the drug. The drug release from the system is controlled in a manner with zero order kinetics so that the reduction in the dosage frequency and increase enhancement in the patient compliance is significant. The next advantage probably is supposedly flexibility. Various types of flexibilities in terms of the materials chosen, in terms of the manufacturing methods which can be applied are available. Control delivery of hydrophilic and lipophilic both drugs can be very well taken care of. Then finally, it has got another very significant advantage is that it also has potential for intermittent drug release. Extremely programmable pumps can facilitate intermittent release in response to various factors such as cardiac rhythm, metabolic needs and requirements, etc. Needless to say that whenever a system which is being designed pharmaceutically offers certain very significant advantages, on the flip side, it also has a large number of demerits or disadvantages. Let us try to sum up the various demerits or disadvantages of implantable drug delivery system. The first thing which comes to our mind is, it is an invasive device. Why invasive? For its insertion of the implants in the patient, a major or minor surgical procedure is required. The second disadvantage is in terms of termination of therapy. The non-biodegradable polymeric implants can be terminated from the body also with the help of a surgical method at the end of treatment. That means we go under the knife while it is being added to the body, we unfortunately have to go under the knife while it is being removed. Then the major disadvantage which needs to be appreciated pharmaceutically and in context of the drug delivery system behavior is danger of device failure. It could be something like due to some reason the device fails to work properly during the whole course of therapy or the whole duration of treatment. So then again, there would be a requirement of surgical steps which has to be taken for removal of the device from the patient's body. The next disadvantage is limited to potent drug. How do I we explain that? The size of the device is very small. We cannot have this big device. We have a very small device which it probably, if it is bigger, it will add to the patient's discomfort. So we have no option but to limit ourselves to devices which are very small in size. And therefore, by default, only the potent drugs which are very small in dose can be used in this sort of system. Another disadvantage which probably is important to understand is the adverse reactions. 
if the high concentration of drug is delivered at the implantation site maybe because of the burst effect maybe because some other scenario the therefore there is always a chance of adverse reactions due to this local high concentration and sometimes very difficult situations can arise where tissue necrosis can happen let us start talking about the various types of implants the foremost kind is referred to as the solid implants under we have the first variety which is called as the in situ depot system amongst the novel drug delivery systems the in situ depot devices have been developed for sustained action these systems consist of drug loaded biodegradable polymer in semi solid solution or dispersion dosage form after application through a subcutaneous or an intramuscular injection the polymer solidifies and form solid depots the drug release from the system is in a controlled manner with zero order kinetics depending on the resultant depot the in situ forming devices could be classified into in situ forming implants and in situ forming microparticles natural chitosans alginates as well as synthetic polymers like pegylated polyesters resinoleic acid based polymers have been used for manufacturing these these systems have been explored widely for the delivery of various therapeutic agents like anti neoplastic agents to proteins and peptides such as insulin in situ depot forming devices have several advantages in comparison to the conventional biodegradable polymer control delivery devices these are number 1 it is supposedly less invasive and painful as compared to the other implant and which definitely improves the patient compliance the manufacturing of such a system is easier with low manufacturing cost ideal characteristics of an in situ forming system the viscosity of the system should be low the loading of the drug should be achievable by the simple process of mixing The excipients used in the formulation should be biodegradable and biocompatible with the human body system. The drug should be stable in the system. The system should be able to present a minimum initial release of the drug for the purported action. As in case of other drug delivery systems, we have got a varieties of the depot preparation systems. they can be summed up as dissolution controlled depot preparations adsorption type depot preparations encapsulation type depot preparations and esterification type depot preparations the first variety is designated as dissolution controlled depot formulation system in this depot formulation the dissolution is a rate limiting step for the drug absorption so drug absorption can be controlled by slow dissolution of the drug particle the rate of dissolution that is q by t into d under sink conditions is defined as q by t into d is equal to sa ds cs divided by hd where we must understand that sa is the surface area of the drug particles in contact with the medium ds is the diffusion coefficient of drug molecule in the medium cs is the saturation solubility of drug in the medium and hd is the thickness of the hydrodynamic diffusion layer surrounding each of the drug particle as just mentioned a while ago the dissolution is a limited step in case of such a depot drug delivery system 
So we can have a various types of approaches which can be utilized to control the dissolution. The first approach is formation of salt or complexes with low aqueous solubility. The typical example of such preparation includes penicillin G procaine and penicillin G benzathine. From highly water soluble alkali salts of penicillin G and naloxone palmoate and nalitroxone zinc tannate from the water soluble hydrochloride salts of naloxone and naltrixone respectively. The sheer change in the chemistry or formation of the salt leads to low aqueous solubility which will in turn help in a slower controlled drug delivery. The second approach is the usage of suspension of macrocrystals. The particle size of drug affects the dissolution. Macrocrystals, which are the large crystals, are known to dissolve more slowly as compared to the microcrystals or the small crystals. This is known as the macrocrystal principle. The surface area of the drug particle is directly proportional to the dissolution and this can be applied to control the rate of drug dissolution. A very typical example of such an action is the use of aqueous suspension that is of testosterone isobutyrite for intramuscular administration. We have just mentioned about the dissolution based or dissolution limited depot preparation devices. We come to the next category that is referred to as your adsorption type depot preparation. How they are developed? They are developed by binding of the drug molecules or any therapeutic agents to the adsorbents. The word adsorption type depot preparation in itself clarifies this. In this case, only the unbound free species of the drug is available for absorption. As soon as the unbound drug molecules are absorbed, a fraction of the bound drug molecules is released to maintain the equilibrium. So we have a drug which is adsorbed onto a system, then there is a little amount of unbound drug or the free drug, it gets absorbed. Immediately when it is getting absorbed, the concentration in this device is more as compared to this part of the membrane. So what happens is that in order to maintain an equilibrium, there will be a spurt of drug release. This is very typically used in vaccine preparations in which the antigens are bound to highly dispersed aluminium hydroxide gel to sustain their release hence prolonging the duration of stimulation of antibody formation. So we have an aluminum hydroxide gel onto which the antigen is adsorbed, then there will be a slow release of antigens and after that slow release, while the slow release is happening, there will be continuous stimulation and there will be an outcome where we will have large number of antibody formation. The next type of depot preparations are referred to as your encapsulation type depot preparation. This type of depot preparation is formed by encapsulating a solid drug within a permeation barrier or dispersing drug particles in a polymeric matrix. The release of drug molecule from the depot is controlled by the rate of permeation across the permeation barrier and the rate of biodegradation of the barrier macromolecules. Both permeation barrier and diffusion matrix are made up from bioabsorbable or biodegradable macromolecules like lactic glycolide copolymers, alginate, chitosin, gelatin, dextron, polylactic acid, phospholipids and long chain fatty acids and glycerides. Some of the examples where this approach has been used include that 
in case of naltrexone palmoate, which consists of biodegradable my microcapsules, liposomes, and norethindrone releasing biodegradable lactide glycolide copolymer beads. The next type of method includes esterification type of depot preparations. Esterification type of depot preparation is formed by esterifying a drug to form a bioconvertible pro-drug type ester and then formulating it in an injectable formulation. This chemical approach depends on the number of enzymes that is esterases present at the injection site. Thus such a formulation forms a drug reservoir at the site of injection. The rate of drug absorption is then controlled by the interfacial partitioning of the drug esters from the reservoir to the tissue fluid and the rate of bioconversion of the drug esters to regenerate the active form. The examples which can be quoted here include flufenazine enanthate, non-drolone decanoate in oligenous solutions. We just come over to discuss now the in situ forming implants. In the in situ forming implant systems, the drug is dissolved or dispersed in biodegradable polymers as semi-solid or as in solution. The formulation changes its form after administration into the body by chemical or physical means and get translated into either a gel or a solid form. The concept of an in situ forming implant was originated by Dunn in the early 1980s. Dunn et al. used injectable depot system loaded with antibiotics for local treatment of periodontal diseases. Let us now try to understand the various types of in situ forming implants. They can be summed up as the first as thermoplastic pastes, number two in situ cross linked polymer systems, thermally induced gelling systems, pH induced gelling systems and in situ polymer precipitation systems. Thermoplastic pastes. In this system, the melted semi-solid polymers are injected into the body and a depot, which is gel-like, is formed upon cooling at the body temperature. These devices, having low melting or glass transition temperatures, ranging between 25 to 65 degrees centigrade, and an intrinsic viscosity in the range of 0 0.05 to 0 0.8 deciliters per gram. It allows the drug delivery of antibiotics or a cytotoxic agents. They can be used as subcutaneous drug reservoir from which diffusion into the systemic circulation is controlled examples of such polymers which can be used are DL-lactide glycolide, E-caprolecton and dioxone orthoesters. In case of polycaprolecton that is PCL an injection temperature of 60 degrees centigrade is required which is painful and causes necrosis at the injection site wherein polyoxyethylene has good biocompatibility and relatively low softening temperature in the range of 35 to 45 degrees centigrade. The drugs can be incorporated in the formulation by directly mixing with the molten polymer without addition of any solvent. Thermally induced gelling systems. In this system, the initial formulation 
is in the form of a soul system. That means it is a polymeric solution, which on changing the environmental temperature gets transitioned or converted into a gel. Polymers like Pulaxomer 407 forms a liquid in an aqueous medium at room temperature but transforms into a reversible semi-solid gel-like structure at the body temperature equating to 37 degrees centigrade. In the figure in front of you, you can simply see a scheme showing a polymer solution and then it's being converted into a gel after an enhancement in the temperature. Recently, the temperature responsive gelling system has attracted considerable attention of many researchers for its potential application in biomedical and pharmaceutical fields. The aqueous solution of polymer in soul state on cooling while it becomes a gel at an elevated temperature. Many polymers undergo abrupt changes from soul to gel as a function of environmental temperature. The thermosensitive polymer like poly and isopropyl acrylamide, poly nipam exhibit sharp lower critical solution temperature that is referred to as your LCST at about 32 degrees centigrade which can be shifted to body temperature by formulating the polynipam based gels with salt and surfactant. However, polynipam is not appropriate for biomedical applications due to its well-known cytotoxicity. It results in activation of the platelets and also has a limitation as it is non-biodegradable. Triblock polyethylene oxide, polypropylene oxide, and polyethylene oxide copolymer, PEO, PPO, PEO, are referred to as pleuronics and poloxomers and have shown considerable chelation at body temperature at more than 15% weight by weight concentrations. However, these have got Conspicuous demerits like change in the osmolarity of the formulation and kinetics of gelation can happen. Blurred vision and crusting in the eye can be another biological limitation. The next systems are referred to as your pH-induced gelling systems. The pH-sensitive polymers contain pendant acidic or basic groups that either accept or release protons in response to changes in the environmental pH. The scheme in front of you just depicts the same. You have got a polymer solution which is categorized to be pH sensitive. If it is exposed to the various changes in environmental pH, it resorts to gel formation. It is being understood that the polymers with large number of ionizable groups are known as polyelectrolytes. In case of weakly acidic, that is the anionic groups, swelling of hydrogel increases as the external pH increases, whereas decreases if the polymer contains weakly basic or cationic groups. The most commonly used polymers are carbopol, Carbomer or its derivatives like polyvinyl acetyl, diethyl amino acetate, polyacrylic acid, polymethacrylic acid, PMA, and polyethylene glycol, that is PEG. The next type of systems which we would discuss is the in situ cross linked polymer systems. To control the diffusion of the hydrophilic macromolecules, the formation of a cross-linked polymer network is advantageous. The cross-linked polymer network transforms into an in-situ cross-linked polymer by free radical reactions.
which are primarily initiated by heat or absorption of photon or ionic interactions between cation and polymer anions. The injectable in situ cross linkable polymer hydrogel system is preferred for three main reasons. The first reason is it can be formed into an des any desired shape at the site of injury. The sole systems may be situated in a complex shapes and then cross link to each other by stress and form the required dimension. The cross linkable polymer mixture can adhere to the tissue during the gel formation and the resulting mechanical interlocking arising from surface micro roughness can strengthen the tissue hydrogel interference. So we have the tissue into which probably this particular gel formation agent is present there. There will be an entanglement between the tissue and this gel form which will add to the tissue hydrogel interface strength and it will probably be also filling up the various rough surfaces. Introduction of an in situ cross linkable polymer hydrogel could be accomplished by injection or laparoscopic methods, thereby minimizing the invasiveness of the procedure. So it simply can be understood that, that the in situ cross linkable polymer hydrogel system can be simply injected at that particular site. There will be an uh, un, uh, so, sort of surface which is uneven, then probably there will be hydrogel formation, the tissue and hydrogel will come in contact, will add up to the strength and finally remain there in the shape which is desirable. Dunatol used biodegradable copolymers of DL lactolactide and levolactide with E caprolactone for preparation of thermosetting system for prosthetic implants. It is simply more or less some, putting something into the cast and then allowing it to be taking the shape of that particular cast. Since it requires a free radical producing agent such as benzoyl peroxide into the body for conversion in gel, it may induce a tumor promotion. So this is one thing which probably has to be borne in mind whenever we are going in for the usage of such type of symptoms. Another scientist group, Hibble et al., they studied a photopolymerizable biodegradable hydrogel system for protein delivery. This system consists of a macromer, polyethylene glycol, oligoglycol acrylate using a photo initiator such as eosin and visible light. The system showed controlled release of protein over an extended period of time that is even to several days. These hydrogels however are limited to surgical sites which are accessible to light. So the point which is to be remembered here, the site, the surgical site has to be accessible to light because it would be triggered by the virtue of the visible light. We next have the ion mediated gelation system. Certain polymers undergo phase transition in presence of ionic environment. This might include alginates, calcium ion or chitosan in presence of the phosphate ions. In this system, the drug loaded polymer is in a sole state and gets transformed into a gel system in the presence of ions. The concentration of the cross-linking ion available under physiological conditions is usually insufficient for cross-linking of the polymers. Only the calcium ion concentration in the eye can lead to in situ formation of alginate formulations. However, there are two important factors which limits the calcium alginate usage. The first one, its potentiality of immunogenicity and the second one that it takes a very long time for in vivo degradability. In situ polymer precipitation. The concept of in situ forming drug delivery systems based on polymer precipitation was first developed by Dunn and co-workers in 1990. 
it simply works on the principle of polymer precipitation due to water solvent exchange. A water insoluble biodegradable polymer is dissolved in a biocompatible organic solvent and the drug or therapeutic agent is added with continuous stirring to form a solution or suspension. When the formulation is injected into the body, the water miscible organic solvent dissipates and water penetrates into the organic phase and leads to phase separation and precipitation of the polymer forming a depot in, at the site of injection. The commonly used polymers for development of these formulations include polylactide glycolic PLGA 50 is to 50 and 75 is to 25 ratio respectively. Polyglycolic polylactic the solvent used are N-methyl 2 pyrrolidinone that is NMP dimethyl sulfoxide DMSO 2 pyrrolidone PEG 400 and triacetin N-methyl 2 pyrrolidinone which is used in the FDA approved in the is comes in the name of Eligard. This method has been designed and used for the atrial technology, which is targeted for carrying Eligard, which contains the luteinizing hormone, releasing hormone that is LHRH agonist leoprolide acetate in doses between 7.5 to 22.5 or 30 milligrams. The polymeric system which is being targeted here consists of polylactide glycolic acid PLG 75 to 25 ratio dissolved in N-methyl 2-pyrrolidone in a 45 is to 55 mole by mole polymer to NMP ratio. The system, however, suffers from a major limitation of the burst drug release. This burst drug release primarily can be dependent on the factors like concentration of the polymer in the solvent, molecular weight of the polymer, type of the solvent used, type and the concentration of the surfactant employed. Also, the drug burst is directly related to the dynamics of the phase inversion. Major demerits of such a system includes the possibility of a burst in drug release, especially during the first few hours after injection into the body. The next question arises that how can this burst drug release be controlled? There have been primarily four factors which can be examined and optimized in order to control the burst of drug release. The first one is the concentration of the polymer in the solvent which is proposedly taken. The molecular weight of the polymer which definitely be an important factor. Then the solvent type which is used, the type of surfactant used and its concentration employed and conclusively the burst release is also related to the dynamics of the phase inversion. If we are able to control the burst drug release then we are absolutely able to overcome this possible demerit and make a formulation which can be favorably used for a controlled prolonged reaction at the site of injection. So my dear students, I am sure that we have been able to understand the basic concepts of implantable drug delivery device through our this presentation. Let us try to summarize what we have learned in this module. The first point which we talked about was that implantable drug delivery systems are sterile preparations for parenteral delivery having the ability to deliver the drugs at a controlled rate for extended period of time.
It has got a plethora of advantages such as patient compliance, improved drug delivery, convenience, controlled release, flexibility of delivery and intermittent drug release wherever required. Of the many systems, the in-situ depot systems have been developed for sustained action and consisting of a drug-loaded biodegradable polymer in semi-solid solution or dispersion forms. The depot preparations are classified into the various categories like dissolution control depot preparation, adsorption type depot preparations and encapsulation type depot preparations and also esterification type depot preparation. Each one has got a basic principle and a premise and which can be very well exploited and optimized for best therapeutic outcomes. In-situ forming implant system consisting, consists basically of the drug dissolved or dispersed in a biodegradable polymer as semi-solid or in solution. The in-situ systems are further classified into thermoplastic pastes, in-situ cross-linked polymer systems, thermally induced gelling systems, pH induced gelling systems and in-situ polymer precipitation based systems.